Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight. I'm Phil Ponce. Paris Schutz and Brandis Friedman have this evening off. And on this Labor Day, the Workers' Rights Amendment is on the ballot this November. We'll talk about what this means for workers in Illinois who want better pay and working conditions. We're spread out all over the place. Chicago residents have long played a big role in organized labor, and with more workers looking to organize, we take a deeper dive into the world of unions. A new book takes a colorful look at pioneering icons of the arts in the LGBTQ community. And the legendary Bud Billiken Parade is expanding its reach to a prominent new downtown building, at least an existing one. But first tonight, the Workers' Rights Amendment is on the ballot this November. It would guarantee Illinois workers the right to collectively bargain for things like wages, hours, and working conditions. There you can see the text of the amendment. So what does this mean for Illinois workers and the economy? Joining us are Jacob Hubert. He's president of the Liberty Justice Center. And Mark Polis, executive director of the Indiana, Illinois, and Iowa Foundation for Fair Contracting. Gentlemen, thank you for being here. First of all, uh, Mark Polos, if I can begin with you. And first of all, let's take another look at the language so we can get a clearer idea of, uh, or exact idea of what it says. Employees shall have the fundamental right to organize and to bargain collectively through representatives of their own choosing for the purpose of negotiating wages, hours, and working conditions, and to protect their economic welfare and safety at work. Uh, Mr. Polis, in plain terms, what would this amendment do? Yeah, good, uh, good evening. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to be here uh, with you uh, today. Uh, so in plain terms, uh, this amendment uh, creates a safer workplace for individual employees in the state of Illinois, puts more money in their pocketbook, and gives them a voice in the workplace that is beyond just statutory, but is a constitutionally protected fundamental right. And you say uh, beyond statutory or uh, other language. Uh, how is this different from existing protections? Aren't there some of these pr protections around already? Sure. Uh, there are these types of protections, both at the federal and state level. Um, but the problem is that employees have to rely on legislators, right? So when you have an unsafe working conditions, you have to hope that there's a statute that's in place that will actually protect you. Uh, if there's not, you have to go to your local legislator, get individuals in a majority from both the House and the Senate to approve it, get the governor to approve it, uh, and then create that safe working environment. Much like the First Amendment freedom of speech or the Second Amendment right to bear arms or the Fourth Amendment right against illegal search and seizure, uh, this gives you a fundamental constitutional in the very place that you spend most of your life in. And Jacob Hubert, you oppose this amendment. How come? Well, people need to know that this amendment would do absolutely nothing for workers in the private sector. Federal law already governs collective bargaining in the private sector, and the Supreme Court and other federal courts have been very clear that states cannot enact their own laws to govern private sector collective bargaining. So although this appears to give new collective bargaining rights to all employees in Illinois, the fact is what it really does is give stronger collective bargaining rights to public sector employees and their uh, unions in Illinois. That's what this amendment is really about. It literally would do absolutely nothing for private sector employees. Jacob Hubert, do you agree it would do nothing for private sector employees and strictly benefit people in the public sector? Yeah, so I think that uh, I think that question was uh, uh, kicked over to me, Mark Polis. Uh, uh, we uh, wholeheartedly disagree. Thank you, my <laughs> my mistake. Uh, but no uh, but the basic question: Would it benefit primarily uh, workers in the public sector uh, and not really do anything for people in the private sector? Uh, this amendment does everything for everyone. The uh, text of the amendment starts with the term: Employees shall have the fundamental right to. Quote, end quote. That's how it starts and that's how it ends. Uh, this amendment applies to every single employee. Every employee in the state of Illinois is on the ballot on November 8th. So where you can choose politicians that you want to run for office and you think you want to favor them, you can favor yourself and vote for yourself if you're an employee in the state of Illinois. There are a plethora of exclusions of individuals in the National Labor Relations Act, in the Railway Labor Act, and all other federal acts. Um, so it applies equally to both. 
both Jacob and the folks at IPI and other institutions attempted uh, this argument in both the state court and at the appellate court and failed miserably. Both the state court uh, dismissed a petition to file a complaint against this, and the fourth district appellate court also uh, sided with the trial court and dismissed that. Jacob Hubert, uh, how about that? You have uh, had a couple of defeats in the lower courts. Uh, you're appealing to the Illinois Supreme Court. Why do you think the outcome might be different there? Well, the Illinois courts have said nothing about the issue I just raised. In fact, we, the Illinois courts have only said so far that taxpayers can't challenge this amendment before it's passed. But the attorney general hasn't even argued that we're wrong about what I just said, about the fact that this would do nothing for private sector employees. Sure, it says all employees in the amendment, and they put that there, I guess, so that you would think that it applies to all employees. So if you're in the private sector, maybe you'd want to vote for it because it would do something for you. But in fact, the law is clear that they cannot give this right to private sector employees. So after this thing is enacted, if it is, it's only going to be able to give protections to public sector employees and, yes, the relatively small handful of private sector employees who are outside the scope of the National Labor Relations Act. But, of course, the overwhelming majority of private sector employees are covered by the National Labor Relations Act, and this amendment would do absolutely nothing for them. And the courts certainly haven't said otherwise. And, again, the attorney general in defending this hasn't even said otherwise. The attorney general's office has just said, well, this should go on the ballot anyway. Taxpayers shouldn't be able to challenge this right now. Mark Poulos, another argument uh, against this uh, by your opponents is that it would basically give unions too much power and result in higher taxes. Respond to those concerns. Well, let, let's just start with the first uh, first point, which is uh, giving unions power. Uh, giving unions power give workers power. Uh, unions are one of the single most democratic institutions in the country. Officers, uh, executive board members, business agents, elected by the ranks of their membership to represent themselves. So when we say the term unions, it is synonymous with the term workers. Right. So what we're trying to do is not uh, put unions on a pedestal. What we're trying to do in the state of Illinois is to say uh, we want to create a good business climate. But what we also want to do is create a good worker climate. So how, about the issue of, uh, how about the issue of higher taxes? Presumably, if you're negotiating stronger uh, contracts for public workers, could mean wages go up and ultimately taxpayers foot the bill. Well, what I would say to this is there is uh, no data that would suggest that uh, taxes would go up by virtue of this amendment being passed. Now, there are folks out there that have just uh, loftily thrown around things like, you know, increases in property taxes and other. But what I'll give you is some data. Uh, Illinois Economic Policy Institute actually just performed a study uh, where it looked at strong collective bargaining states, which Illinois is and would be stronger with this amendment versus those that are not strong. And what it found is that uh, individuals in strong collective bargaining states are 3% less likely to live below poverty level, 3% less likely to rely on Medicaid, 2% less likely to rely on food stamps and government assistance, and contribute 8% more in state income taxes. So in terms of uh, whether this is good or bad for the economy, th the data speaks for itself, and, and clearly uh, it would be better for the Illinois economy to put more money into the pockets of workers and create a safer work environment. Mark, uh, uh, Jacob Hubert, we're almost out of time. I'll give you the last word. How about that? This is a big discussion, obviously, a big question. But do unions make the economic life for everybody better? Well, Illinois has very strong public sector unions, some of the strongest in the country. And so take a look at Illinois' economy. Look at our taxes. Look at the businesses and residents fleeing this state because of the burden these, their governments and their taxes put on them. And then ask yourself, who put us in this spot? Who's influential that advocates for the tax increases that we have, for the high tax burden? Well, it's the public sector unions who push for these things. So people can think about whether uh, public sector unions have been good or Illinois' economy when they go into the ballot booth to vote on Amendment 1, if it ends up on the ballot. And, gentlemen, that's where we'll have to leave it. Jacob Hubert and Mark Polos, thank you both for participating. Important insights uh, from both of you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And up next, a colorful new book by local artist showcases influential icons of the arts in the LGBTQ community. So stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, 
the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. From Swan Lake to Frankenstein movies to the pop charts, the arts have always been deeply influenced by artists from the LGBTQ community. A new re newly released book shines a light on 50 pioneering artists from around the world who made indelible contributions to culture. Producer Mark Vitale recently spoke with one of the book's creators, who is himself something of a local arts icon. Here is another look. Russia doesn't acknowledge that Tchaikovsky was gay. A new book recognizes the composer of Swan Lake for his artistry and for a part of his personal life that has been redacted from some biographies. All of these people did so much to enrich our daily culture that we, we, hear, we hear or see all the time. And a lot of people in the book are people that may have fallen out of the spotlight that we wanted to acknowledge and tell young people about them. The record companies wanted to portray her as this girly girl, and she said no, she just wore what she wanted. We met artist David Lee Sisko, who, with writer Owen Keenan, made the book to honor late arts icons, including some last-minute additions. Owen and I had a conversation in this bookstore back in February a year ago. We were looking at the publications that were out there, and I said, you know, I think we could do a much better job and make a really lively, fun book that celebrates the history of the LGBTQ community in the arts. And so the book sort of came out as a project that the two of us thought wouldn't be cool to do this book. Cisco's work is all over town, from the mosaics at the Belmont L station, to stained glass windows in Lurie Children's Hospital, to tote bags for local businesses and nonprofits, including Lyric Opera and our sister station, WFMT. So it starts out as sketches, and then I scan the sketch with my iPhone to my computer and then I build it from there. I look for wonderful pictures of the subject. Uh, in the case of uh, Radcliffe Hall, who wrote the first acknowledged lesbian novel, which has a terrible title, The Well of Loneliness. But there, there were pictures of her and her partner with their champion dachshunds in England. And since I have a dachshund, I was thrilled to find that picture, so I drew her with a dachshund. James Whale, the director of Frankenstein, was drawn with an electrode on his neck. Frida Kahlo got a little mustache on her lip. From Frida to Freddie Mercury, the makers of the book had a tough editing process. We looked back and made a list of our favorites, and then we basically arm wrestled as to who got into the book. But we really wanted to be representative of the community at large, even though all these people have passed away. But we really wanted to celebrate them. Celebratory or not, the book is being published in a challenging political climate. Sooner or later, everything becomes political, and especially in the time we live in now, where certain politics are trying to erase certain things or take freedoms away from various groups. And the fact that we made this as a book for young people, and now that's being challenged in uh, public education in Florida. We're really lucky to live where we live, where we can bring things forward and bring them to the table. And hopefully this book is a wonderful book for young people and their parents and their relatives and their friends to create discussion and, and just make people feel good. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. The book LGBT, LGBTQ Icons was just published, and you can find out more on our website. And up next, a deep dive into the world of unions in a conversation that first aired on Chicago Tonight, Latino Voices with Univision's Alex Hernandez. So stay with us. Don't miss one of our stories. Get them all delivered to your desktop or mobile device with a subscription to the WTTW News Daily Briefing. Go to WTTW.com slash Daily Briefing and sign up. Chicago Union organizing has played a big role in everyday life, ranging, ranging from Labor Day to eight-hour workday. But it's not all history, with workers in a variety of fields trying to unionize and uh, change labor laws in the state. Joining us now with more on the labor movement here in Chicago are Don Villar, Secretary Treasurer for the Chicago Federation of Labor, and Lenny Sanchez, an organizer with a right share and delivery driver coalition justice for op workers, as well as Jose Alcala, 
president of Painters Local 184 District Council 14. I want to welcome gentlemen. Thank you for joining us today. And we're seeing an, an increase you. in labor organizers, both nationally and locally. Don, how has Chicago traditionally been a home for organizers? Uh, Alex, you know, Chicago, we like to call ourselves the hometown of the American labor movement. And you know, from 1877 in the great uh, railway strike where workers in Chicago and Pilsen, they got up and they fought for their rights. And in 1886, when workers at, uh, at the Haymarket and, and their fight for eight hour, or eight hour a day and a weekend, and that, came, that started here in Chicago and around the world, they celebrate Haymarket on May Day. It is celebrated here. And in 1896 in Pullman, where um, you know the, the, the railway workers strike there, and that led to why we celebrate Labor Day. Labor Day is because of what happened in Chicago, in Pullman, and the great strike of 1896. And then uh, throughout history, Chicago and the workers in Chicago have played a major role in, in the workers' rights movement. And we continue to do that today day, and you're seeing that with the workers' rights amendments, which you sort of alluded to, where we're trying to enshrine, where we're going to enshrine the right to have a, work, a voice at the workplace, the right to have a union in the in Illinois' constitution. Yeah, there's definitely a big history of unions here in Illinois, especially in Chicago. And as we know, Illinois is surrounded also by right-to-work states, which make it very difficult for employees to unionize. Jose, how is Illinois different, and do you expect any legal changes when it comes to organized labor? No, not as long as uh, we have uh, support of the governor here and great leaders like Bob Ryder, the president of the Chicago Fed, and Don Villar behind us, we won't have any changes. That's why we need the change uh, and make that change to the Constitution with the Workers' Right Amendment that will give you uh, bargaining uh, rights when you go to do your, your when you pay, also will help you with your safety. If you see anything, you can say something, they can't mess with you. If we don't get that change, then it might become a right to work state. We don't want that. Definitely. Uh, a little bit on the history of Chicago, just so you know, uh, Chicago has been built by Latinos from 1967 to the present. From the John Hancock to the Sears to the Standard Oil, the one mag mile, the drywallers and the drywall finishers were Mexican American and Latinos. Just so you guys know a little history, we built the city from the ground up. Very interesting, definitely. And Lenny, you work with independent contractors. What are the challenges organizing workers who aren't unionized? We're independent contractors. It's a major hurdle in unionizing. And with the workers that we're focusing on being Uber, DoorDash, Grubhub, Lyft, et cetera, this is not your traditional workforce that's all found under one roof, whether it's a warehouse, a factory, a farm, whatever it is. We're spread out all over the place, and it has an insane turnover rate of about four. It's a retention rate of 4% yearly in this industry. So the defining body, contact everybody, there's a lot of challenges with organizing everybody, but we're doing our absolute best, and this coalition is a big step towards doing that. Yeah, right. Jose, you work with uh, painters. How is unionizing with uh, people who work in the trades different than like uh, the efforts at places like Starbucks and Amazon? Well, see, and uh, that Starbucks and Uber and all the gig workers, what they're trying to do is they're trying to get what we have. When you join a union and the painters union, after 300 hours, you get full, you get full uh, insurance, vision, dental, and, and medical after 300 hours. And after three years, you make close to $90,000 uh, a year. That's a difference. Now, uh, well, the gig workers, they're trying to, they're trying to come in, they're trying to get insurance, they're trying to get coverage, and that's what they're trying to do. That's the difference between a labor union and a gig union, and hopefully the, the gig workers and the, the share ride workers can all do that. The Star Starbucks people can come in the fold and join in and get, get medical insurance, get pension, and get welfare, you know. Lenny, that's the main thing. Thank you. Uh, Lenny, what kind of uh, response have you gotten from, like, large rideshare companies like Lyft or Uber? Have you had any success? Uh, very little. They really are just robotic, cold-blooded companies that don't care. And I can tell you that from experience. I've had a passenger pull out a gun on me, and their solution was to never pair me with that passenger ever again. And from all the experiences and speaking with so many drivers that have been victims, of attacks, carjackings, and the family members that have survived, the ones that have been 
murdered, unfortunately. These companies are ro as robotic and cold-blooded as it gets. The only way we're going to get anywhere is where we're all unified, fighting together for what we deserve. Definitely. Now, going back with you, Don, in the past, there have been efforts to divide workers along racial lines to prevent unionizing. What kind of tactics do you see now when companies fight unionize, unionization efforts? Uh, today, Alex, I mean, one of the things that we, we were seeing, especially for a lot of our Latinx and our people of color, uh, there, uh, there was a report that came out back in April that la Latino workers have a higher rate of death or injury on the job because of the, their immigrant status or because of you know, their minority status than everybody else. So, I mean, that puts that it's, worker safety is at risk, especially when they when they pit us because against each other because of our immigration status or because of you know people of color. That's been the history where workers have been pit against each other, uh, and we continue to see that today. And uh, just what um, you know what. Lenny was mentioning was oftentimes, you know, workers who are, who are the gig workers, they tend to be workers who, who are marginalized. And, uh, and because of that status, you know, they're, they're, they become victimized. And that's one of the challenges that the labor movement is, we're always fighting, we're fighting for people's rights, we're fighting for people's workers, workplace safety, and then to give them a voice and to, to, to fight against that discrimination that uh, marginalization of workers. I mean, there's right. value in all work and value in all workers. Union membership has declined significantly in recent decades. Do you think that trend will uh, reverse? And I'll go uh, back with you, Lenny, just for this last question. We have less yeah, than 100%. 15 seconds. 100%. From what I've seen in swings, from talking to drivers for years now, the union is, I, support for unionization is very strong and is very popular and is very common and i'm very confident we'll be doing we'll accomplish that guys i want to thank you for your time today thank you lenny sanchez thank jose alcala and don villar welcome Alex. thank you back with more chicago tonight right after this One of the oldest parades on the city's south side is marching its way downtown. The beloved Bud Billiken Parade is being celebrated in a film projected beneath the stars. Arts correspondent Angel Ido recently took us to the loop for the story, and here is another look. The Chicago Defender newspaper is really what uh, caused the launch of the Bud Billiken Parade. It was the newsboys that would go out raising or someone selling the newspaper. And Robert Abbott, great granduncle, um, came up with the idea to celebrate them, gave them bikes and, and instruments to go down the street and celebrate. And that's how we started the uh, Bud Billiken Parade in 1929. 93 years later, the Bud Billiken Parade, or the Bud, is still marching down King Drive, celebrating one of Chicago's most influential African-American newspapers. We are able to show that, you know, the community can come together, kids can come together in a very positive and peaceful way. The parade marches from 39th to 55th on King Drive, bringing together black Chicagoans through entertainment, food, and fun. But this year, the parade is also taking over a prominent downtown building in a projection film titled Billiken. It features dancers from the Bringing Out Talent Dance Company. We did get some footage last summer, not even knowing if we was going to actually make it on the Art on the Mark. But just to have the footage already prepared and ready, so it's definitely dope and exciting to see it. As one of many dance groups to perform regularly in the parade, Shekana Stewart says watching themselves downtown is important. Seeing themselves up there, it pushes them to want more and do more. So we're going to hope that when they see this and their family see it and they see that we're doing things with the kids that, you know, we normally don't do, it's going to get bigger. But that exposure the film provides isn't just for community members that attend the parade regularly. It's so powerful that Bud Billy can be displayed on Art on the Mart at the Merchandise Mart because it gives people from out of town an opportunity to know more about this great event that's huge beyond measure but also those in the community can uh, feel proud about their tradition. We're talking about 93 years. So 93 years and many generations get a chance to see uh, the Bud Billiken displayed in a way that's never been displayed before. 
for Chicago Tonight, I'm Angel Ida. And you can see Billiken at Art on the Mart every night at 9 and 9.30. But act fast. The last day to catch the show is Wednesday. <laughs> and we're back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols. The Jim and Kay Maybe family. The Polk Brothers Foundation. And the support of these donors. And that is our show for this Monday night. Don't forget to stay connected with us by signing up for our daily briefing. And you can get Chicago Tonight streamed on Facebook, YouTube, and our website, wttw.com slash news. You can also get the show via podcast and the PBS video app. And please join Parrish Schutz and Brandis Friedman tomorrow night live at 7. We leave you tonight with some archive footage of the Bud Billiken Parade. Now, for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Phil Ponce. Thank you for watching. Stay healthy and safe, and happy Labor Day. Good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that supports free educational initiatives in the legal profession.